Tonight, a former rugby player calls for more acceptance for gay players. Hi everybody, welcome to Gay Talk Tonight, I'm Andrew Whiteside. Well, my guest tonight is Ryan Sanders, the former New Zealand rugby player. Ryan Sanders is a former rugby player in New Zealand's NPC, or National Provincial Cup. This year he officially came out asking for more acceptance of gay rugby players. In 2010, Ryan was named the Young Entrepreneur of the Year and runs his own travel company, Haka Tours. Ryan, great to meet you. Thank you for coming on the show. No problem. Now, of course, you've been quoted in, in the papers as yeah. uh, your, your background in the MPC and then mm -hmm. coming out and, and how difficult it was to you. Yeah. So I wanted to start off by getting a sense of literally what it was like. Clearly, rugby was your life. You loved it, but there was something you were hiding. Yeah, definitely. I mean, rugby, you know, New Zealand's national sport, played it since I was sort of six or seven years old. So, um, yeah, I look forward to it every year. And, um, yeah, I love the camaraderie and the team environment and everything like that. And, yeah, just really, really enjoyed the game. But... Um, yeah, definitely the gay side was a bit of a struggle, um, just in the sense of rugby's a very social sport, so there's a big element outside of rugby, so having to feel like, you know, you're hiding part of those elements wasn't so much, I mean, it was difficult, it wasn't so much a stress, but it was something which, um, yeah, I knew I wanted to explore further, and for me, um, I always knew I was going to come out, and um, yeah, it was just a bit difficult to sort of combine the two, especially in my sort of late teens and early twenties. What do you think it was? Was it the fact that you were uncomfortable with yourself or was it the culture itself that seemed, that would be negative or would give you a hard time? Well, it's funny because now that um, all of my rugby mates know that I'm gay, they're completely great about it. I've never had any negative feedback, but I think that's because I came back out when I was a little bit older. It probably would have been a different, um, yeah, different scenario if I sort of came out in my teens or twenties. I think it's probably a bit of both. I think probably I felt it was more from my side feeling uncomfortable um, but yeah I can't say it would have been plain sailing or easy sailing if I did come out at that time from their point of view as well so um, especially all the stuff you know sharing you know the changing rooms and all that sort of stuff so um, yeah I think primarily it was an issue that sat with me but um, I don't think it would have been easy if I did come out at that stage anyway. Because certainly no one in the rugby fraternity has come no, out. No, we need that, big time. And that's why a lot of people talk about the need for a gay or black. Which from my point of view personally, that would have been huge. Because I was one of those kids growing up and I loved rugby, playing it from a very young age. And you know, I idolised the All Blacks. Um, and I knew I was gay from a very early age, so around about preschool time, so before I was five. So for me it would have been really, really amazing if there was a gay or black that I could sort of look to and aspire to. You were quoted in the paper as saying you made fake, made yeah. fake girlfriends. <laughs> well they actually weren't fake, I actually had them, I just wasn't into them. So um, there was one particular scenario when I was uh, yeah, dating the coach's girlfriend for a, oh not his girlfriend, his daughter, for um, a year or two. and. Um, yeah, it wasn't so much I had fake girlfriends, it was I had them, but I wasn't really that into them. So a bit, a bit of a heartbreak, <laughs> eh? <laughs> oh, not really, oh, I don't know, don't think but, so. But it must have been hard though, you know, and mm. particularly, I mean, the, the coach's daughter, for goodness yeah, sake, you know, I mean, you know, you break her heart, you know, you've got yeah. to deal with, with not only her dad, but the guy who's making the decisions. Ultimately. Yeah, I think like a lot of um, gay guys that have come out, we talk about having girlfriends and using them as a bit of a cloak, and it was definitely that, and it was no different for me, really. Um, I think I was more hyper aware of people, you know, thinking that I was gay than people perceiving me as gay. Now that I've come out, everyone said it was a complete surprise, no one had an inkling, but that's not how I felt, especially when I was in my teens and twenties and I thought I needed to have a girlfriend to sort of, you know, mask that side of me, really. I can imagine that such a hyper-masculine environment mm. and, and, you know, rugby players, particularly all blacks, really have to emphasize that because these are tough games and they're yeah. tough men. I guess that could be an issue for them. Yeah. Did, did you ever felt, feel that there was something going on there that if, if you had come out, it would have been dangerous or at all? I don't think it would have been dangerous. Um, I just think it would have been really uncomfortable. And I think, you know, when you're playing any sport to a, a certain level, um, it's not just the physical side of things that's really important, it's also the mental side of things. And especially a team game like rugby where there's 15 players, um, you're only as sort of strong as your weakest member. So every person plays a really important role. So if, if, if the team's not gelling and if the culture's not right, then yeah, it can really affect your performance. So mm, 
Definitely not dangerous, but yeah, I think there would have been a lot of sort of pressure and a lot of uncomfortableness, definitely. Because teams overseas have, have dealt with this. Before. Yeah, they have. Yeah, the, it's the been UK amazing. The UK has had a few. Yeah, and, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. even uh, Ian Roberts. Yeah, I mean, that was huge. That was a long time ago. Yeah, that was. I remember that in the 90s. And I think that was in my last year at high school. He was well before his time, and I think that was extraordinary. I mean, he was an amazing person. He often got the hard men of league title. Um, and he was just as, you know, as big as the game could be at that point. So for him to come out, that was huge. Um, so yeah, the Australians have got one up on us. Damn. Yeah, they, they, haven't got, they haven't got the marriage quality yet, though. <laughs> they have the most important you know, one. They, they <laughs> scale, the scales are still trying to, trying to balance out there. Yeah. So you've created a new career for yourself, essentially. You became yeah. the young entrepreneur in 2010. You won that mm -hmm. award. That must have made uh, quite an impact on where you were going from then on. Yeah, it was more so, from my point of view, just, uh, um, just to put a stake in the ground and, and sort of get some recognition that I was on the right path, really. So it was great, got an award from um, the Prime Minister, John Key, and um, yeah, that was in 2010, and then end of last year, um, the global accountancy firm Ernst & Young named me as one of New Zealand's top um, young entrepreneurs, up and coming entrepreneurs, which was really, really cool. So um, I just think it just gives your business a bit of validity. And from my point of view, I deal with you know hundreds of different suppliers, um, and so it just makes some of those conversations and some of that negotiation a bit easier. So you're involved with Haka Tours, yeah. and just tell me a little bit about that, because it's, it's quite an intriguing concept. Yeah, so we run um, 7 to 24 day adventure and snow tours of the country, small groups, we market solely internationally and purely online, so we're not sold through agencies or wholesalers. Um, average age is sort of 25 to 40, um, and they're sort of quite sort of high adventure tours, but based that middle market, it's nothing too extreme or nothing too elitist, anyone can come along. Um, but be prepared to have your, your boundaries pushed a bit. So yeah, massive market in Australia, UK, Canada, uh, USA, Singapore, Hong Kong. Um, and then we've started Vertic integrating with their own accommodation brand, Haka Lodge. Um, these are pretty much will be the nicest backpackers you've stayed in. We've got one in Queenstown, one in Christchurch, Auckland's in development. And we plan to open seven more over the next five years. Do you think there's a secret or what is the answer to having a, a happy, fulfilled kind of life? I really think it comes down to sort of balancing your life. I think it's all about balance. Um, and I think the key components for a happy life are your family, your friends, um, your personal well-being and your health, um, your relationships, and obviously your working career because you spend a lot of time working. Um, and I think, you know, those sort of five key elements, I think... You can't be happy um, if one or two of those elements is sort of being disregarded or left alone. I think it's all about building up those sort of five different elements and um, yes, spending equal time and effort in all of them really. I don't think if you're really rich you're going to be happy. I don't think if you've got lots of friends but actually you don't enjoy your work or you haven't got good relationships with your family you're going to be happy. I think pretty much all of those four or five quadrants need to be you know, fed and loved and, and grown. That's fantastic. Ryan Sanders, thank you so much. Been a real pleasure. No problem. Next week, we chat to a young, talented Brazilian drag queen with a Kiwi connection. Thanks for watching Gay Talk tonight. I'll see you again very soon.